Alright guys, welcome back to the video. So we're back in the shop today. I just finished cleaning up those panels and yes, you guys saw me use a hand plane there. Uh, the hand plane that I'm using is a really old, it's a Stanley Handyman. So it's basically, it's just one of the crappiest lines of uh, Stanley hand planes that ever came out. And it is by far the best and simplest way to clean up glue squeeze out. So if you want to get yourself a hand plane for cleaning up glue squeeze out, the ones at Home Depot, I think they're called like the Footprint brand, something like that. They're super crappy planes, but they would be the exact same as this. That'd be really good for just cleaning up that glue squeeze out. Because it has a nice flat bottom to it, which means you're not going to risk damaging the wood around it as much as you know using like a scraper or something so a nice really crappy hand plane works great for cleaning up that glue squeeze out anyway our panels are looking absolutely beautiful we've got a nice flat surface to them i wasn't expecting them to stay this flat during the glue up uh, but when I have them all laid on the table side here, there's actually no, you know, obvious severe cupping or movement or anything that's happened. All of the panels are still nice and flat across. So what I was expecting to do to these today was take out whatever minor cupping that that would have happened while they were sitting in the glue up. So I was just going to run them through the drum sander and then we would set them aside. But because they are as flat as they are right now, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to set them aside with some weight on top of them and then leave them until we actually need them. And so you can see that on like this top panel here, we've got just a little bit of uh, cupping there, but nothing that is as bad as I was expecting. I was expecting these to be, you know, full potato chip by the time I came back into the shop this morning. So since we don't have to worry about flattening those panels this morning, what we can start working on is those side rails, those big hefty pieces that are going to be an absolute nightmare to mill. Uh, these guys right here, in case you forgot. So these boards are gonna need to be, I believe it is 80, 85 inches long. I have to double check that in the plans. So they have to be 85 inches long and 12 inches wide. Now, obviously in the shop here, I cannot possibly mill a piece of lumber that is that large. I can't joint it and I don't feel safe putting that piece that big through my planer because my planer, uh, these DeWalt planers are, you know, they're, I think it could do it, uh, but I think the chances of it tipping and sending the planer flying or going vertical and having the planer go climbing down it, uh, there's any number of things to go wrong there and I don't want to mess around with that. So what we're going to be doing to actually make this work out is we're going to start by cutting this down just a little bit shorter. Whatever excess material is on this board that I don't need, I'm just going to get rid of it. So over the lengthwise there. So then we're going to attempt to edge joint one of the edges. So I don't know if I'm going to use the jointer. I think that might be a little bit too on the risky side. Uh, plus this is very heavy and I don't want to risk damaging the, the tables on my jointer. So I think what the best option is going to be is just using my low angle jack uh, to just clean up that one edge. Then once we have that nice square edge, we're going to Bring it over to the bandsaw, slice it right up the middle there, and then we're going to be left with two basically six inch pieces. From there, I can mill those two six inch pieces the exact same as we did all those other pieces initially. Okay, so with both of these boards, I was very limited in the choices that I had. I wanted a 12 inch wide board, and when you're going for that width, there's, you're really limited in what you get to choose from. So I think at the lumber yard, there was maybe three or four boards that were this 12 inch width, or that I could get a 12 inch width out of, that I had to choose from. And I tried to choose the two best ones. Now, that was a major compromise, because as you can see from this board, this is the back side of it. This is the side that I'm definitely going to have as the inside of the back side of the stretcher. You can see that there is actually bark showing on this side, which guarantees you that there is going to be sapwood here. So even though it's a rough saw board, I know for a fact it's going to have a decent amount of sapwood right in these areas here. Now, in some areas, I did go through and clean up with my hand plane, and I can see that we do have a decent amount of heartwood content right in the middle. And if we flip this board over without breaking my fingers, we can actually see that most of this side is heartwood. So we have a little bit of a sapwood section down here, a little bit of sapwood at the top, and I think a lot of our edges are actually going to be a decent amount of sapwood, which kind of sucks. But again, it's more important for the whole design of this thing that this is a nice solid piece. Because most of the time with these side rails, the top and bottom edge is going to be completely hidden by, you know, the blankets from the bed. So we're only ever going to see the face of it. So the face is what matters the most. And so there's two things we want to consider here. First off, we want to start by just trimming off the end. That way we can actually see more what we're working with. And we'll go with the side that has more heartwood on it. Obviously, that's going to be pretty arbitrary because over the length, it's going to change drastically. The other thing that we want to consider, not so much on this board, but a lot on the other board, is what kind of knots and figures are showing.
Okay, side one looks absolutely sweet. We got solid hardwood all the way across. I may have been wrong about the uh, sapwood content. I'm sure there's some in the middle of the board, but at least right here, that is, that is a beautiful sight for my eyes. That is just, oh, it's gorgeous. We're gonna spin the board around and cut off the other side. Side number two, I'd call this about 95% heartwood content. So we've got beautiful heartwood all the way through here. A little touch of sapwood right in the corner there. So I think on this board, we're gonna be going with the other end just purely because it is solid heartwood. So it's really, again, it's not gonna really make that big of a difference. Uh, we know that we have a small uh, sapwood section right in the middle there. But again, obviously this board is a lot better than I thought it was gonna be. I thought this, this whole backside of this board was gonna be sapwood, but obviously, According to both of our ends anyway, it's looking pretty dang good. Okay, so before we make this cut to whatever size we need to cut it to, we're gonna double check our plans, which is always the smartest thing to do. So if you check out the plans there, that side stretcher needs to be 81 inches long. But we also need to add on the thickness of our footboard and our headboard. Because at this point in time, I don't quite know whether or not I wanna do through joinery, I just wanna do hidden joinery. So I wanna make sure that when I have this board, the way I'm gonna cut it right now to make it for all the milling and that, I wanna make sure that I have all the options present for me at the end. So because I know that my headboard and footboard are both gonna be one and three quarters of an inch thick or maybe just under that, all I'm gonna do is add two inches to both sides of this board. So we go from needing an 81 inch long stretcher to now needing an 85 inch one to include our joinery. All right, so we're gonna be taking our measurement from this back side here, because that's the side with solid hardwood content. And like I said, we wanna go 83 inches and make sure that we're doing that as accurately as possible. We wanna make sure we're looking at our plans, know exactly what we're cutting to. Some of you are freaking out right now. I did that intentionally, relax. I know that's supposed to be 84 inches. Again, before we make the cut, double check the plans. I know I want 81 inches plus two inches on either side. 81 plus two plus two equals 85. Wow, I almost screwed that up. I tried to make a joke and I almost screwed myself up. Oh, that was bad. That would have been horrible. And again, just to confirm, we are at 86 inches. 86 inches is more than enough material for what we're gonna need to do because I know that I need 85 to do through joinery, so 86 gives me an extra half inch on both sides. We're good. We are good to cut this. Board number two. First side of board number two, we've got some pretty good cracks in here. Well, not, not huge, uh, but stuff that could be problematic later on. We've also got a decent section of sapwood. We're going all the way up to sapwood right on the edge here. So overall, this side is not horrible, but if the other side is better, we're definitely gonna go with it. Okay, so the side number two looks really good, but there's some other stuff around it that we have to talk about before we can actually make a decision here. But what I wanna talk about just quickly here is that the way that the wood is dried is just so interesting. Because if you guys haven't seen it, I made a video a while back of you know, what you need to know about black walnut before you start working in it. And in that video, I talked about how black walnut is typically dried in three different ways. First off is air dried, second is kiln dried, and third is steam dried. And so depending on the way that the wood is dried, it'll affect the overall color and tone of the wood. Now from all the research I've done, air drying is supposed to be what brings out the most color and you know, has the most variations. You know, It really keeps a lot of the you know, deep purple colors in walnut. Uh, whereas when you kiln dry, you lose some of those really deep, rich purple colors, but you still keep a decent amount of color. Whereas if you steam dry walnut, the benefit of steam drying is that the sapwood takes on a little bit of a darker tone and is closer in color to the heartwood, but you just kind of mute all the colors all the way across. But you can see here how we got all this beautiful color in here. 
This is just a gorgeous piece of wood. The only problem with this end here is you can see that we have two pretty good knots. So what is making all this cool figure on this end grain here is these two big knots that are here. When you're looking at a board, especially walnut, because walnut generally is sold with a lot higher knot content, you know, it has more knots to it, uh, because it has different grading rules than every other domestic hardwood. So it's generally gonna have more knots in it, but a lot of people look at the knots in, in walnut and go, oh, that's a bad thing, I don't want knots, I want perfectly clear stock. But what the knots do is they create figure. That is how you get figure in a board, except in woods like maple where you generally get a lot of figure all over the place. Uh, but in woods like or like walnut, you're gonna get a ton of figure around these knots. So when you see a board with knots in it, don't just kind of scoff it off and you know it's not worth it because some of those knots are gonna provide amazing figure. But in this case, because I know that I wanna work from this end because we got solid hardwood going across here, I wanna make sure that I cut in past where the pith of this knot is because you can already see it that this knot has a crack going through it. So the center of a knot is no different than the center of the tree. The pith of the tree is gonna be the weakest possible point where if you have boards that have the pith of the tree running through it, which is just a fancy word for the center of the tree, it's gonna split. The pith of a knot is no different. So you need to make sure that you stabilize it when it fits in your final piece, or you need to make sure that you cut it out. So because we know over the whole length of this board, we need to take off about 10 inches, that works out perfectly because we can take five off of this side, five off of the other end where we have that small crack, and we should be past the knot on this side and past the crack on that side. So the knot was actually quite a bit bigger on the underside. I should have checked that before I started cutting into it. Uh, so I just had to take off an extra four inches, but we still managed to get the whole board that we need. We now have two 86 inch long boards. I got most of the way through the crack on that other side. It's still there a little bit, but we have that extra inch that we can cut off when this thing is all finally milled and all that. But again, I am so thrilled just looking at this cross section here. This is a beautiful piece of wood, at least, at least on that end. This is a gorgeous, 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 gorgeous piece of wood. And so now we're on to the fun part of trying to get these boards into a position where I can actually mill them. Because now we need a nice straight edge, or at least a cleaned up edge, that I can reference against the bandsaw fence when I'm splitting this board in half. Okay, so that is one almost perfectly straight edge. So this cherry paddle blank, which you guys will get to see on Sunday in the live stream, uh, but I just jointed one edge of it to make it so that I could use it as a straight edge of this because this cherry piece is easy to pass over my jointer. It's nice and safe, it's stable, all that stuff. Whereas this big walnut board, obviously not safe. I also use my Veritas uh, winding sticks, uh, which all they do is you use the, you put one on the front, one wherever the area you're checking is, and then you sight down them. And if the lines are not lined up nicely, then you know that you have some twist. If they are lined up nicely straight across, then you know that there's no twist. So I did that all the way down the length. So we now have a mostly straight edge that has no twist to it. So that is, exactly what we want to have happen. And it's pretty safe to say that I have the utmost respect for people that are like hardcore hand tool users. I cannot imagine having to do this whole board in this method. I thought about it. I really, I, I, I considered it to be how cool it would be to go through and do this entire board uh, all with hand tools. But after just doing that one edge, I, I don't know if I'm up to it. It's, it's such a cool idea that you know, there's a lot of potential to being able to, you know, if I could just get them mostly flat and to the point where I could actually pass it through the planer because I could set up roller stands to make passing it through the planer a little bit safer. Uh, I'm still, I'm still thinking about it. It would be a lot of work, but it would be so cool to be able to use these just in a solid board without having to cut into them. So if you don't own a low angle jack, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Doesn't matter what kind of woodworking you're doing. If you're working with real wood, having a good hand plane, especially a low angle jack is just 
immeasurably useful. So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the edge on the other board and then I'm going to ponder uh, about my life choices and think about whether or not I actually want to try flattening these boards all by hand, at least on one side, or get them to a point where they're flat enough to then pass through the planer to then get them, you know, the rest of the way flat. And I think that that might be a lot easier and safer than going through the effort of cutting them on the bandsaw, jointing them, then going through the planer, then gluing them back together, all that stuff. It might just be easier and more practical to mostly flatten one face with the hand plane uh, and then go to the planer from there. So I gotta have a think about it. It is quite a it is quite a daunting task, but it might it might be possible. And if I decide to do that, this probably won't all be happening in today's video. Uh, that's that's a that's a lot of work if I decide to go that route. Okay, so as soon as I did that last clip and I said I might I'm thinking about uh, doing this by hand just to keep these solid. And if I get one side flat, I can pretty safely get it through the planer as long as I set up some roller stands. So what I'm thinking now is that that's actually not an unrealistic expectation. I think doing it with the low angle jack is gonna be an absolute nightmare and I might still do it that way. But what I'm thinking is that I've got two other available options here. One, I could go buy one of those little electric hand planers, so that at least saves me the physical effort of moving that of moving the hand plane around. So that's somewhat better. Plus those are three and a quarter inches wide versus my two and a quarter inch low angle jack. So that's an extra inch per pass. That's an option. So I was looking at those at Home Depot, those are about 200 bucks a piece. The other option here, and you guys might think of where I'm going if you think about yesterday's video, buying a sheet of MDF that is eight foot long. All I have to do there is cut off the edges, attach them to the side, and I have a new router sled. That is an eight foot long router sled that I can fit an eight quarter thickness in, and I could just use the router to flatten one side, pass it through the planer. We now have a flat board, all while keeping this board solid. It's something to think about. It's definitely, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna pop inside, uh, think about this for a little bit. I'm kind of tired right now from hand planing that one surface. I have a lot to think about here because that is a much cooler thing. I was thinking that I really, my only option here was to split this board to do the milling. But now that I'm thinking about it, there are there are so many other options. And and what I like about the uh, electric hand plane option is that it's a it's it doesn't take the physical effort. They are kind of a useful tool to have around. You know, if you're like trimming door frames and that, uh, when you can't accurately you know move a hand plane in that direction, so it might be a good tool to have around. But the also the option of buying just a sheet of MDF, turning it into a router sled, I really like that idea because then that would mean that I could work with big boards like this. Anything well not much wider. I can't actually go any wider than 12. This would be the biggest board I could work with, but I could work with boards like this. And I think, I think that that there would, oh, I think that there's something to that. I, I don't know. I don't know why I, my brain is so obsessed with keeping this board solid right now, but I just, if I have the option to do it, I really, really want to try it. Okay, so I still haven't made a decision yet. I'm kind of, I'm still torn between the three different ways. I think because I'm a fairly cheap person, I don't really want to have to buy something if I don't have to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go start by getting that one board that I have the clean edge on. I'm going to go and start trying to get that flattened with just my loin jack. I think that it's going to work out. It's definitely going to be more work and I don't quite know if it, if it is going to work. I've never hand planed this large of a board by hand, you know, with my hand plane before. I've done some small boards and they worked out, but I don't know if in this case it's gonna work. But again, we don't actually have to get it perfectly flat. We just have to get it flat enough and uh, not, you know, take any of the twist in that out of it so that we can get it through the planer. Okay, so a decision has been made on how we're actually gonna go about milling these boards. Uh, so I just got back from Home Depot and I picked up a sheet of three quarter MDF. Now what this is gonna do is gonna let me make the router sled for the router. Now the reason I ended up going with this method is because I don't wanna put these boards through my planer no matter what. Even if I have roller stands on both sides, that's just gonna be a lot of physical work. If we were to use the hand plane flatten one side, either the electric or the or the manual hand plane, uh, you would end up having to take this board, constantly moving it back and forth through the planer, doing you know 30 seconds of an inch pass each time. That is a lot of passes and I don't even have to carry these boards each time. So I'm just gonna move the lathe out of the way, I'm gonna move the bandsaw back where it goes, and I'm going to kind of clear out this area so that way I can just back in my truck, drop that sheet of MDF onto some sawhorses, and just start working with it all in this back area here, rather than having to you know, move it to some other weird area of the shop.
Okay, so we now have our sheet of three quarter MDF in the shop. It's up on three sawhorses and we're good to start messing around with it. So now what we need to do is cut off both of the factory edges and that's what we're gonna to use to build our reference surface. So then what I'm gonna do is once we have those pieces cut off, I'm gonna move my workbench over to this side of the shop and so that I have a full eight feet on both the in-feed and out-feed side of my table saw. The other thing I'm gonna do here is we're gonna narrow this slightly. So I don't want the full four feet across, that's just too much material to try and you know fight with here. And so it's very important when we're cutting off these strips to get them to an accurate size, we need to make sure we know what depth we're aiming for. Again, we know that our final size of these boards we want them to be about one and three quarters of an inch thick so I know that my router has about a two inch room of travel uh, that it can go up and down you know move around like that so right now our slabs are about two and three eighths when they're all leveled out here off of the table and I know that I need to take them down to about one and three quarters so I know I need at least five eighths of an inch of travel between the top where we're just doing a surfacing and the bottom where we're doing our final thicknessing so what that means I have to account for that across this whole board which is extremely important to do so if we just imagine that this is the slab we're going to be creating if we make these side rails too tall we're not going to be able to reach our bit and we're going to have to take those side rails off and resize them whereas if we make them too short all we have to do is on our actual router sled the thing that the router's riding on this carriage right here all you can do all you have to do there to make it actually work out is just add some thickness to the bottom here Okay, so credit where credit is due, this Craig jig for the uh, circular saw here is actually pretty sweet. I was able to rip both of the strips off the, one of the edges and they came out to the exact same width to the precise two and a half inch uh, width that I needed. So the, everything about that is perfect. So good job Craig on this one. Normally I'm not a fan of Craig products. <laughs> uh, garbage job, miter gauge here by Craig. Uh, do not buy this. Anyway, back to the video. And now all we have left to do is attach our side pieces, so our things that are going to define our depth, and all we're going to be doing is using more Craig products, which are pocket hole screws. We're just going to throw some pocket hole screws along the outside edge here, attach this piece to this bottom board, and we'll be all good to go. So the one thing that I might do here is move this whole setup onto my workbench because what I'm finding is that the sawhorses are not nice and level all the way across. We definitely have a little bit of a hump right in the middle here, which is not unsurprising. The floor of the garage here is just concrete, uh, so it could have moved and shifted since it was poured. And you know, unless it was poured you know, really well, it probably wasn't perfectly level when they poured it.
All right, guys, so before I showed you how amazingly this board turned out, I want to say a quick thank you. Uh, I got a comment on my uh, 3,000 subscriber announcement video. Uh, and the gentleman, his name's Greg, he uh, pointed out that, you know, he knows that doing a daily upload schedule is a lot of work and he hopes I'm holding up well. And I just wanted to let you guys know that so far since I started doing this daily upload, it's been you now four days now, uh, this is this is exactly what I've always wanted to do with YouTube. This is honestly so much more fun. And as you guys can probably tell from the way that these videos are coming together, uh, you know, I'm changing my camera angles. There's a lot more stuff going on. There's just, the videos are much more involved. They're longer. They're just, I find them way more enjoyable. And I think they're edited even a little bit better than they normally were. So I'm just, this is why I'm, I'm just enjoying this process so much. Because when I wake up in the morning, I know I'm going to go out to the shop. I'm going to work on the project. I'm going to get as much work done as I can by four o'clock. Then at four o'clock, I'm going to go inside and start editing the video and get it released. And so it's ready for the next day. And it's just, this daily process so far has just proven to be so much fun and so enjoyable. And I just want to say a huge thank you to y'all, you guys, you know, coming back every day to watch the videos, liking, leaving comments, all that kind of stuff helps my videos become a little bit more popular on the YouTube platform, helps more people see them and helps bring people to the channel. So I'm going to continue doing these daily uploads because I'm absolutely loving the process. And I hope you guys will keep coming back to watch these daily videos because they are going to be a ton of fun. But anyway, without further ado, let's show off this amazing, piece of wood. So this has to be one of the most amazing specimens that has come through my shop ever since I started woodworking. I, it's so hard to show it off on camera because the camera just, you know, the exposure and all that and flattens the image. It just does not look nearly as good. Plus we have all these milling lines still, which this stuff is all the stuff we're going to take out with the hand plane later on. But this board alone, we've got a ton of beautiful figure, you know, coming right through here. You can kind of see it there. It comes up. We've got two little lines of it right on this end. Then this area from the knot downwards, this is just, check out that grain structure. Oh, it does not get any better than that. This is, this is just awe-inspiring. And we still have another board to do, so we'll get to see what is hidden in that one. And so we're almost out of time in the shop today, so I'm not going to try and thickness this one today. So I'm going to take this one out of the jig here and lean it up against the garage door. I'm going to get the other one loaded up and we're going to try and get it flattened today. That's all I want to try and accomplish today. Then when we come back in the shop tomorrow, then we'll actually do the thicknessing and see what the uh, uglier sides of these boards are going to look like. Because mostly I just want to see what that other board looks like. I am so, this one got me so excited and you know, you can tell by the amount I'm shaking the camera, about how exasperated my voice is. I really am excited to see what is behind that other one. So we're going to get that one loaded up and start milling it down. All right, so that is how you mill a board of basically any size for under 500 bucks. And that's not even joking. The router cost about 300 bucks. The router bit, I think, cost about 50 bucks. And then the sheet of MDF cost 89 bucks. All that in Canadian. So if you're, near, if you're in the US, it's even cheaper. So, and you could literally mill any size board you want. Again, this router method, I don't really see any of the big woodworkers on YouTube ever talk about this method because one, it is kind of messy, but it is so good. If you, especially if you're in a small shop, you're limited by space. And especially if you don't have the money to go out and buy a 12 inch joint or, you know, a big 16 or 24 inch planer, this can do literally everything that those two machines can do for 500 bucks. So I highly recommend on one of your upcoming projects, rather than cutting boards down, you know, keeping stuff small to fit on your machinery, 
try this method because it is so worthwhile. These two stretcher pieces are probably gonna be the coolest part of this entire bed. Forget the book match panel, forget the whole, you know, footboard, headboard. These two boards, at least to the woodworkers anyway, I think are gonna be the coolest section of this entire bed. And so I am gonna call it a day there on this video, guys. So tomorrow we'll come back in, we'll actually get these down to the proper thicknesses or close to them so that we can actually go back in and clean them up with a hand plane as we get closer to finishing off these boards for the fitting into the bed. So the main reason I'm leaving it right now is because the, the router is getting quite hot. I don't wanna run it for another couple hours while I do the actual thicknessing part of this. So I wanna let it cool down at least overnight. I don't wanna risk burning out my nice expensive router. But I do hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions about this whole router method of flattening and you know, jointing, planning, thicknessing boards, please feel free to leave them down in the comments below. But as always guys, I do hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.